The Paris Exposition was undoubtedly one of the most important events that happened in the year of 1937, if for no other reason than the fact that it brought together, for the first time in the history of world expositions, the official flags of 44 nations, which waved side by side in a spirit of international goodwill. With unbiased minds, therefore, let us review this modern spectacle, which glorified the arts and crafts of peace, and help to develop a better understanding between the peoples of a world that still has faith in the ideal of man's humanity to man. A panorama from the Eiffel Tower reveals how this international exposition was cleverly designed on the banks of the historic Seine River in the heart of Paris itself. Many of the city's older landmarks, such as the bridges of the Seine and the Eiffel Tower, being cleverly utilized without jeopardizing the ultra-modern aspect of the exposition. And now we come to the pavilions which each nation contributed by way of representation at the exposition. The Canadian pavilion was an idealized version of one of Canada's many grain storehouses, and the adjoining pavilion of Great Britain was a modest representation of the British Empire. The Swedish pavilion had a charming simplicity, and that of Czechoslovakia was a model creation of future architecture. The United States pavilion was constructed according to American methods, featuring the typical setback design and the American Indian motif. In association with the United States Pavilion, it is fitting that we should show a monument on the Seine, which is one of the relics of the Paris Exposition of 1889, and a small duplicate of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, which was presented by France to the United States as a symbol of liberty, fraternity, and equality, upon which was founded two of the world's greatest democracies. France's colonies were well represented at the Exposition, and nothing was more impressive than the pavilion of French Indochina. Perhaps the most impressive of the colonial pavilions was that of French West Africa, representing Senegal, the Ivory Coast, Dahomey, French Sudan, Mauritania, and other colonies with alluring and unfamiliar names. For a brief interval, our international tour was interrupted by a thrilling demonstration of water skiing in the Seine, one of the lighter features of the exposition. Towering over the Russian pavilion, we behold a monument which was generally conceded to be one of the masterpieces of the exposition. This gigantic statue, approximately 100 feet in height, is said to have been designed by a young girl in Russia, where it was modeled and shipped in sections to be assembled and set up as we see it here. Walking up the Avenue of Nations, we pause to admire the very colorful Egyptian pavilion, representing one of the world's oldest styles of architecture. The tower in the background was that of the Hungarian pavilion around which the colorful life of a romantic people was faithfully reproduced. The 
The native costumes of a people often reflect the spirit of the people themselves. And when a group of Hungarians get together in their native costumes, regardless of time or place, the inevitable consequence is a chardash. Representing Norway was a pavilion with a huge aluminum cascade over which a thin veil of water flowed in imitation of a typical Norwegian fjord. Next to the Norwegian pavilion, under a colorful array of flags, stood the Spanish pavilion. Here we were entertained by typical music and dancing which associated itself with the province of Segovia in Spain. Just outside the Spanish pavilion, in the center of the Avenue of Nations, was the so-called Fountain of Peace, considered to be the most beautiful aquatic display ever executed by the hand of man. The French have always been masters in the art of constructing artificial water displays, but they excel themselves when they constructed in the same river the world's most colorful and sensational illuminated fountain. These beautiful fountains were manipulated by electricity, and the mastermind behind them sat at an organ-like instrument, literally playing the chords of color that we now behold. Playing with the fountains in their varying moods of color were the pyrotechnical displays, flashing lights and resounding noises which thrilled the thousands who witnessed them from the banks of the Seine. of people who gathered here in an international spirit of peace and witnessed what their respective nations could do if the ugly spirit of war were submerged for all time and each country, regardless of size or power, could safely devote its resources to the cause of peace on earth and goodwill toward men.